Welcome back to Citizens Forum. My name is Will Smith, and today my guest is Daniel Marshall. And Daniel has written a new book that was published last year, right? And you've yes. already won an award for it, is what I understand. It's called Claiming the Land, and we'll put a nice picture of that. And, um, but anyway, this is a part of the history of British Columbia. And Daniel's family has been here for how many generations now? Well, we came with the gold rush, in fact. Oh, you did? Well, you came. we came in 1858, so uh, I'm five generations myself here. Five generations. Okay, yes. so, so this book, tell us, about, uh, tell us about this book. How did you come to write it? Well, obviously, my own family's history, you know, they were Cornish miners who came via the California gold rush to what would become British Columbia in 1858. So as a young lad, uh, I, I grew up with all of these family stories of uh, my ancestors in the, in the, in the gold rush. And uh, as you know, I uh, subsequently went on to become uh, very interested in history on an academic level, having done my first couple of degrees at UVic and then my doctorate at UBC, actually. Um, in history? In history, yes. Um, so this is your life? It's my life, you know. British Columbia history is indeed my life. And in the case of the gold rush, um, I was just so surprised that nobody had given a fuller treatment to what was the foundational event that led to the creation of what would ultimately become this province, British Columbia. You know, the Crown Colony of British Columbia was created late in 1858. And uh, as a young person, certainly, uh, my, my father used to take me up the uh, number one highway, up the uh, Fraser and Thompson River Canyons as a, as a young lad, and uh, share with me the history. Well, I loved it, and I, I typically had, as many still have today, these sort of romantic notions of what gold rushes were all about. Saloons, <laughs> paddle wheelers, you know, steamboats, gambling dens, tr buried treasure, if you will. Um, but as I started to pursue this topic, uh, I, I found that when I researched in archives, particularly south of the border, that is to say in Washington State, Okay. Oregon, California, and beyond, that I started to find a very different story. A very different story from what I'd certainly grown up with, from my own family's stories, or the kind of books that I read. And it was a story about this amazing conflict that had unfolded, not mm -hmm. only on the Fraser River in 1858, but war, in fact, between indigenous peoples and uh, foreign gold seekers here on this side of the 49th parallel and all through uh, what is Washington state today. Um, when I first started reaching, uh, researching this, uh, quite frankly, uh, some of my academic colleagues kind of questioned some of this, right? It's so unknown. Hmm. But I began to accumulate more and more evidence uh, for this story that really had not been explored at all. This foundational story of the creation of uh, British Columbia. So uh, really what it came down to is the Fraser River, first of all, what most people don't realize, you know, uh, people in British Columbia, Canada, when we talk about gold rushes, we immediately think of the Caribou Gold Rush. Or on the island here, maybe we think of the Leech River Gold Rush. We know the Fraser Rush, but how many of us know that it was in fact the third great mass migration of gold seekers in search of a new El Dorado? So the first two? Well, the first two, of course, were California and in 1849. 1849, okay. Huge rush. And then within a few years, the Australian rush of the early 1850s. And then the Fraser River rush of 1858, the third largest mass migration. And in terms of numbers, how many were there? Well, yeah. we typically say there's 30,000 to 35,000 foreign miners that quickly swept into places like Victoria, where we are today. So what was the population of Victoria before that? 
started? Was oh, it pretty that's, small? That's a good question. You know, Fort Victoria, which had been established in 1843, so a few years before this, had a population maybe of 400 <laughs> non-natives, we must stress, <laughs> 600 maybe. So it was a camp, really. more than <laughs> It was the fort. You know, uh, with the drawing of the 49th parallel to the coast in 1846, with the final settlement between the United States and Britain, mm -hmm. um, the Hudson's Bay Company could see on the, the writing on the wall for their interests south of the border. Of course, they had been established on the Columbia River and uh, in, in many ways were forced to relocate north of the border. So uh, they, this is one of the reasons they established Fort Victoria here, uh, to ultimately move their base of operations out of uh, the southern half of the old Oregon Territory, which had become, I you know, see. by that point, definitively part of the United States. So, uh, yeah, so the, the 1849 California rush really is one of the huge events on the, on the coast. It's no coincidence. So a lot of people uh, just moved up, up north, then, is what you're that's saying. That's right. And so to get back to, I guess, this whole notion of exploring an archival collection south of the border, so I began to find out these miners, many of them, the majority really are Americans, they're sending their letters from the Fraser River back home, you know, to mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters back in the United States, mm -hmm. maybe all the way back to places in New York or Texas. Their diaries, you know, when they left oh. the Fraser, are to be found south of the border in places like the Bancroft Library in Berkeley, California, the university there. And really, they paint a decidedly different picture. Now, what was that? Well, that was the Fraser Canyon War of 1858. So you can imagine, wow. prior to this gold rush in 1858, yes, you had this place called Vict Fort Victoria, uh, very small numbers of non-native peoples here, but hi history shows prior to the rush here that you had this fur trade relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples that had been in operation for some time. So much so that the so-called custom of the country were you know, whether the, it was these Scotch fur traders or, 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 or Welsh or Cornish, they, they partnered. Mm. In fact, they married uh, indigenous peoples. And this, this was working pretty darn well until another big event had happened on the coast. And that was, and you'll be familiar with this, that was the Oregon Trail. Right. Go west, young man. There's this encouragement to have Americans take the Oregon Trail to, to Oregon, obviously. Oregon, which at that time was from 5440, you know, the right, bottom right, end of the Alaskan Panhandle, right. down to the 42nd parallel, or today's Oregon-California border. Uh, there was this notion of a joint sovereignty between Britain and the United States. Now, that's a very long, complicated story. I, um, we could go on about that. But during that time, you had an extraordinary moment of uh, this fur trade partnership of, of long standing. And uh, all of a sudden with the Oregon Trail and with the uh, rise of American numbers uh, squatting south of the Columbia River, uh, you know, the HBC down there tried to uh, work with them. They, they formed a provisional government before that area became a state of the United States. Right. And with American numbers increasing, finally, they, it tilted the balance. They, in fact, controlled the provisional government, this hmm. compact between the HBC and these new American settlers. And what happened there? Well, in short order, they start passing very racist legislation. If you've got native blood in you, or for that matter, Chinese, or right. black African, or Hawaiian, you don't get to vote. Uh, if you, uh, unfortunately, let's say, if um, something happened, let's say if you were uh, uh, the product of one of these fur trade relationships, one of your children, perhaps your daughter, who would have native blood in them, got involved in a, uh, something like a 
a rape or something, they could not give testimony in a court of law right. against a white person. And of course, the highest expression of this was in about 1844 when they introduced the infamous Lash Law. The Lash Law, which I don't know if it was ever really put into practice, but it would <coughs> uh, flog, they would flog, want to flog people twice a year until they left the state. So there's all of this going on at this time. And then the 49th parallel is drawn. And for Hudson's Bay Company families, of course, they're, many of them are moving up to the British side of the line. But this is another great untold story in the sense that they were moving here for other reasons too. Right. And that was, uh, there was equality under the law. Now, when you know, the gold rush hits, this is extraordinary in terms of the history of uh, gold rushes in the world. Because while I've just uh, shared with you the Oregon situation, when the California rush hits, the same thing happens. If you're a black person, you can't give testimony in a court of law in California against a white person. You can't vote. So rights are being stripped again. This is why... Uh, uh, black Americans like Mifflin Gibbs, who uh, many of your listeners will, be, listeners will be familiar with, who had become the acting mayor of Victoria in the 1860s. This is something that would never have happened in California yeah, or Oregon, right? And so you have something very different on this side of the line. Of course, Governor well, James I Douglas. Have, I certainly have noticed that as, a, as an immigrant here. I'd like to, to just mm. get back to um, the general time frame of this, uh, you're just going to have to buy this book if you want to know a lot of details. <laughs> or you can come. Uh, you are talking uh, on April 1st at Oddfellows Hall, right? Yes, so, yes, I'm delighted. So we can to put up a, a little announcement about that, and you're going to be covering what you've covered in the in the book, right? Or oh, you're yes, going to talk well, about? Look, the book is a big book. I mean, the yeah, center the centerpiece that the most people are focusing on is the Fraser Canyon Wars. It's really the great untold story of this province. But I look at other things too. I look at the fact that the original gold discoveries in British Columbia were, were uh, made by indigenous peoples. Hmm. I look at the fact that it's in fact indigenous peoples who are the first miners of gold here. I talk a little bit about the uh, earlier uh, gold rush on Haida Gwaii or the Queen Charlotte's gold rush of about 1851. Uh, which is sort of a dress rehearsal for what Governor Douglas would have to deal with by 1858. But I also try to place British Columbia firmly in this north-south Pacific Slope context, first okay. of all, right, to explain it in terms of the history, not only of uh, the West Coast, California, mm -hmm. Uh, but then ultimately also to look at larger events. For instance, I look at the fact that uh, 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 Britain uh, in 1858 was at the point of retreating from their interests down in Central America, like the Mosquito Protectorate. Uh, Americans at that time were filibustering in Nicaragua, oh, so right. on and so forth, you know. And it's the Fraser River gold rush that also causes Britain to maintain its presence there so as to have potentially a route from, from Britain via the isthmus, you know, at Panama, right. to bring British gold seekers hmm. through that way and then up the coast uh, to colonize uh, Vancouver Island and British Columbia, the mainland colony. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that the Fraser River rush has never been given any full treatment before. And so this is what I try to do in this okay. book. You know, in terms of such things, I do a lot of work with uh, First Nations here in the province. And if you want to understand why we have things like indigenous land claims, or, or a modern day treaty system, although it, you know, it, it, it goes at a pretty slow place these days, or land claims before the courts. It quite frankly all goes back and starts with the Fraser River Gold Rush of 1858. Well, that is just fascinating and I will be at your talk. So thank, thank you. you very much for being on the show. And I'd like to thank all of our volunteer staff and the Shaw staff for helping us make this production every other week. So thank you for watching Citizens Forum. Thank you.